like we have some people still joining so I'm going to give it just a few more minutes. Welcome everyone for joining us today. Uh, this is our third and final session for our IBM Watson Superclass series. Uh, today we're going to be talking about building and deploying models with Jupyter Notebooks uh, with IBM Project Debater. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. Um, we're going to be talking to uh, a few other data scientists and developer advocates today um, about IBM Project Debater. We're going to be talking about NLU and NLP, uh, which is natural language understanding and natural language processing, and how all of these things play into uh, IBM Project Debater. Um, if you're not familiar with, we'll be introducing you to and showing um, a clip. Um, as well as we move along. Um, but uh, for reference, so IBM Project Debater is IBM's AI uh, that has the capability to debate and form arguments uh, with human beings. Um, so you may, have, uh, uh, you may have seen the clip, but we will show you a little bit and talk about um, sentiment analysis and different pieces of natural language processing how it actually works, and then we will uh, introduce um, the IBM Project Debater Sentiment uh, Lexicon Jupyter Notebook so that all of you can uh, uh, get an introduction to that and learn how to play around with that um, uh, on your own as well. So uh, if this is your first time joining us, uh, welcome, and thank you so much for joining. Uh, if you would like um, I'd like us all to get a little better acquainted. So if you would uh, like to in the chat, share a little introduction about yourself. Um, so name and pronouns, uh, maybe what uh, company or program you're with, um, where you're from, maybe where you're joining from while you're quarantined right now, uh, something you love, and then a quirk. So something that's uniquely weird or different about you. 
Um, so I'll get us started off. So uh, my name is Jenna. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a cloud developer advocate with IBM. Um, I'm from Detroit. I'm currently joining from Detroit. Uh, this is where I've been quarantining from. Um, something I love are my dogs. I have uh, little Yorkies and um, sometimes they get locked in different rooms. I had a dog get locked in a closet <laughs> once and he's pretty quiet. He doesn't really like to bark much. So it was, <laughs> took a while to find him. Um, a quirk, something that's uniquely weird or different about me. Um, uh, so I'll just go with the usual. Um, I have a, a weird obsession with uh, tuna salad sandwiches and tuna melts. So if any of you recommend a really amazing, fantastic, the best you've ever tasted tuna salad or tuna melt, uh, feel free to share it in the chat. Um, if it's on a menu, I will order it. Uh, and I will drive to great lengths to really get a, get a really great tuna melt. Um, uh, I don't have mercury poisoning yet, but uh, with this quarantine, you know, could be going in that direction. Um, so a few uh, pieces of housekeeping. Uh, so if you scroll to the very top of the chat, I have all of the res uh, resources listed there for you. So I have um, the event slides, which you can find at this link. Uh, again, all of the links are posted and I'll be posting them in the chat as we work along as well. So you don't have to worry about trying to find them anywhere. Um, I've also have posted for you. I also have posted for you, um, the IBM cloud signup link. Um, so if you haven't already, you can go ahead and click at the bottom. It says click to check in. That is your link to uh, IBM Cloud sign up. So um, uh, if you haven't already clicked to check in, go ahead and do that. Um, you don't have to sign in or anything. It's just um, uh, taking note of the uh, how many active people we have on the Crowdcast today. Um, but if you don't have an account, uh, you can uh, log in with that link to create one. Um, if you have an account already, you can obviously also use the link to sign into your existing account. Um, I also have the IBM, uh, let's go here. I also have the IBM Debater notebook and data set that we're gonna be using today. Um, that we're gonna be working through a little bit later. Um, also the, uh, URL that you joined at today. So that um, web address is the same link that you can watch the uh, recording afterwards. So the live stream here is going to uh, uh, is going to turn into a recording once the session ends. So if you return back to the same link here, which is listed here, um, you'll be able to access the recording. If um, you need to get any resources or you have to leave early if you want to uh, watch it or share it with other people. The other thing we have here again is um, which you can access with the bottom at the bottom of your screen there is the uh, IBM Cloud sign up link. Um, so this is the link to sign up. Uh, so what um, what you'll be signing up for is a free light tier account. So it's free forever, uh, you will at, um, not incur any costs for having this account at any time. Um, and what's nice about it is we have over 40 light plan services. So things like Watson Studio and um, creating Jupyter Notebooks, um, uh, and different um, offerings uh, that we have, um, uh, IBM Cloud App ID, um, API Connect, things like that. We have light plan services uh, for all of these uh, products and uh, they're at no cost to you ever. So um, if you're looking for things that you can play around with and really get your hands dirty and not have to put in a credit card for, uh, this is the account, uh, this, is, this, is, this is the account for you. So I've already introduced myself uh, and I'd like to uh, introduce a few of our speakers. Um, so uh, these, these, uh, these are our data scientists and developer advocates that are gonna be helping us today. 
um, with running our workshops. Uh, so I want to go ahead and give everyone a chance to introduce themselves. So uh, also, if you would like to connect with any of us, um, feel free to um, connect with us on social. At Jay Written is my handle. So if you want to follow me on Twitter or Twitch or YouTube or anywhere, LinkedIn, uh, you can find me at Jay Written. Um, so some quick introductions. So our first uh, is Julia Nash. I'd like to let her introduce herself and give you a little bit of an introduction to her. Hey, hey everybody. Uh, so yeah, so my name is Julia Nash. I don't know, does, does my picture look kind of like, I don't know, anyways. <laughs> Hi, so I love, um, I guess I'll go over, I'm an offering manager and developer advocate at IBM. Um, you can find me on dev.2. I'm a trusted user on there. I love that site uh, and community. So I also love next.js. I'm totally a stand for it. Um, so that React framework, uh, let's see. AI, oh, I have trusted user there too. Okay, so AI, IoT, um, yeah, I, I love inventing and I, I need way more swag, so <laughs> more swag. I need more swag for like you know different sites I like. So I haven't. I need to get on that basically. <laughs> so nice to meet y'all. Thank you so much. So next we have uh, Sai Shuri. Um, she's going to introduce herself and tell a little bit about uh, about her. Actually, I think you're muted. Uh, you know what? Uh, let's go uh, forward a bit, and then we can go back. Um, uh, you and if you want to uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, sure. Um, my name's Evan. Um, uh, so I'm a data science and developer advocate, IBM Codate team. We are open source, um, and I graduate last year in December. So um, just joined the team, and I develop uh, machine learning and deep learning models. And also I speak uh, a few times in 2020 this year in a few conferences. Um, and also I'm writing some Coursera course right now. Um, and also I analyze uh, performance metrics for the team. Very nice. Um, I think we lost. I think we lost Sai uh, She might be trying to get back in. You know. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking forward here. Um, just want to make sure she gets in. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I don't see her yet, but I'll keep looking. Um, Okay. Um, all right, let's see. I think she's trying to join now. Yeah, I don't see her. Um, let's see. Okay, so we should be connecting now. Not sure what happened. Hello. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Fine. So uh, <laughs> you, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, it's technology and things always go wrong. So that's okay. Um, so Saishwati, if you want to uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. So hello, everyone. And I'm Saishwati and I work as a data scientist and developer advocate in uh, Code IT team, which is Center for Open Source Data and a technologies so i'm uh, i'm open source contributor and uh, majority of my work is related to uh, you know developing data science solutions and uh, integrating open source with product and doing advocacy and uh, i'm currently you know developing courses in the online platform so yeah and i love painting that's like a fact <laughs> or you know something other than work that, that yeah. I would love to share. And yeah, I'm so happy to meet everyone. After a long time, I think I'm doing a talk again. So 
Yeah, very cool. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm sure you probably have extra time to, well, I shouldn't say extra time. You're probably in the right space to be able to do, to be able to do more of that at home. Yeah, I, I love doing it outside. So I used to take my mask. Now I have one more thing, which is like a mask. So I have to take my mask. I have to take everything and go to a beach or somewhere and do my painting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Very cool. So thank you all for being here. Um, uh, very cool. So what I'd like to start with are um, a few badges that I've picked uh, for all of you to uh, take a look at. Um, so IBM has a lot of uh, courses that you can earn badges for completing. They're through a claim. Um, so I've also shared the links for those uh, in the chat. Um, our first badge here is our Data Science Foundations badge. Um, so this is one of our acclaimed uh, cognitive classes. Uh, and it's a three-part series. So there's three different parts um, that you'll earn a badge for completing each part. And then uh, once you've completed all three parts, you'll earn your Data Science Foundations badge. So you're actually earning four badges. Um, and all of our courses uh, on acclaim for earning our badges, they're all free to you to use. So I would highly recommend um, they're not only great to help you uh, learn foundationally and, and um, then learn some more advanced uh, topics um, in more applied areas uh, of fields that you're learning, web dev or data science or uh, cognitive or statistical analysis, things like that, um, for example. Um, and they're free, uh, they're always free to you to, to, uh, to learn with and to earn. And what's nice is you can then share them um, on your profiles, like your LinkedIn, for instance. Um, so you'll be able to show uh, other people in the community or potential employers that, you know, you have a good foundation of learning these topics um, and uh, technical fields. Uh, so the second badge I have here is the Applied Data Science with Python. Um, so again, this is another cognitive class, uh, uh, acclaimed series of classes. So again, you'll receive uh, a badge for each course completed. And then uh, once you complete the three courses, you'll get your applied data science with Python badge. Um, so these are two courses that I think would be really great for uh, anyone learning, uh, just learning uh, data science and looking to explore more with um, Jupyter Notebooks or any data science, uh, uh, creating custom models, things like that. I think this is a good, these are good uh, foundational courses for you. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. So let me just, here we go. Uh, so first we're gonna get started. We're gonna talk a little bit um, about Jupyter Notebooks. So one thing I'd like to do just to get a temperature check is I would like to uh, ask all of you in a poll. Uh, if you look over by the poll section, um, I'd like to get a feel for how familiar with everyone is with um, Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, so if you want to take a second to uh, give your vote there. Um, cool. I see a couple of people voting. So in the poll section along the bottom there it says uh, ask uh, where you can ask your questions. There's also a polls tab down there. Perfect. Um, Perfect. So it looks like we have a few data scientists. We have a few people that have uh, maybe dabbled a bit with notebooks, maybe seen a Jupyter notebook. Um, perfect. And we have some people that uh, this is their first time. Uh, so what is a Jupyter notebook, right? Uh, what is this, uh, you know, this is, this is fancy spiral notebook that data scientists use. Um, so a Jupyter Notebook is actually an open source web application that allows you to create and share documents uh, that contain live code, equations, visualizations, um, and narrative text. So some different use cases for Jupyter Notebooks, so things that you would be using them for are data cleaning and transformation, uh, numerical simulation, statistical model, data modeling, uh, data visualization, machine learning, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, but that's just to get you started. So uh, this, and, and we'll show you what this looks like when we get into the um, project debater uh, sentiment lexicons uh, a little later. Um, 
Okay. So what are Jupiter notebooks used for? Uh, so the joke, oh, sorry, the Jup Jupyter Notebook app is a server client application that allows editing and running notebook documents via web browser. Um, you're also, you can also do this within uh, Watson Studio as well. Um, you have the ability to create and uh, run and deploy Jupyter Notebooks from within Watson Studio. Um, what's nice about it is uh, uh, the Jupyter Notebook app itself uh, from Jupyter uh, can be executed on the local desktop. It doesn't require any internet access and it can be installed on a remote server and access through the internet. Um, the nice thing about uh, Watson Studio Notebooks is everything's done in browser. You don't need to download anything. It doesn't require any dev setup of any kind. Um, uh, so um, uh, you can just log into your IBM Cloud account and go to your uh, Watson Studio instance and access everything from in there. Um, here we go. So how do Jupyter Notebooks work? So uh, a notebook kernel is a computational engine and it executes the code that's uh, contained within the notebook document. Um, and again, we'll show you this uh, a little later on. So there's an IPython kernel uh, that executes Python code um, uh, and kernels for other, like, other languages exist as well. So, um, it doesn't just necessarily have to be in Python. Um, so when you open a notebook, the associated kernel is automatically launched. Uh, you can see this within our Watson Studio notebooks as well. Um, you, there's a little uh, dot on the right-hand side that shows you that when the, the kernel is automatically launched. Um, and then when the notebook is executed, uh, which you can do um, cell by cell uh, as you're working through the notebook, or you can choose to run all. Uh, so the kernel basically performs the computation and produces the results that you'll see as you work through the notebook. So uh, depending on the type of computations, the kernel may consume uh, you know, a lot of CPU or RAM. Um, however, uh, when you're doing this, when you're uh, running your Jupyter notebook within Watson Studio, um, you don't have to worry about uh, using up any CPU or RAM on your computer because everything's done in browser within uh, the IBM Cloud uh, Watson Studio. So what we're gonna be focusing on uh, use case for Jupyter Notebooks today is um, we're gonna be focusing on NLP. Um, so quick temperature check. Uh, you, uh, I want to go ahead and uh, have you guys answer another poll. Um, how familiar are you with NLP and NLU? Uh, so go ahead and um, go ahead and uh, uh, give a vote there on the second poll. Um, so you should be able to see it now under the poll section. Perfect. Okay. So NLP, okay, let me just check here. Okay. All right, so you all able to see the screen now? Uh, natural language processing? No, I don't, oh, so Shruti sees it? I don't see, maybe I'll see it now. <laughs> Oh, okay, uh, the poll didn't load, let's see. I, I can see natural language processing screen. Okay. Wait, yeah, I can't so see you, it. Oh, okay. So if you go to the poll section, are you able to see, uh, are you able to see how familiar are you with NLP and NLU? Is it just me? Does anybody else not see it? Yeah, we still see the previous one. That's what I was okay. saying. All right, how about now? There we go, yeah. Okay, Okay. perfect. All right, I guess you can't have more than one open at a time. Okay, 
Perfect. Um, perfect. So how familiar are you with NLP and NLU? Um, great. Okay, so NLP stands for Natural Language Processing. So, and it's the technology used to aid computers to understand um, human language. Uh, so natural, and, and humans natural language, right? So a lot of times um, if you're flipping through scientific uh, notebooks or, um, uh, you know, professionally written, um, you know, uh, scholarly articles and texts um that's not that's not a human's natural language the way we naturally speak day to day so natural language process is, is uh used to help computers understand humans natural language um so natural language processing uh, is usually shortened as nlp uh is a branch of artificial intelligence that deals with the interaction um oops. Skip ahead here. Sorry, the interaction between computers and humans uh, using natural language. Um, the objective of, of natural language processing is to read, decipher, understand, and make sense of human languages uh, uh, in a manner that's valuable. So most natural language processing techniques rely on machine learning to derive meaning from human language. Okay, so... Here we go. Um, what is NLP used for? So natural language processing uh, is uh, uh, used for a number of things. So a typical interaction between humans and machines using natural language processing uh, looks a little bit like the following example. So um, think of if, you, if anyone has a Google Assistant or an Alexa at home or you use Siri on your phone, uh, this is typically uh, how the interaction would go, um, as an example. So a human talks to the machine, so you're requesting like, hey Alexa, uh, do something. Um, the machine is then captures the audio. The audio is then uh, translated to text conversation. Uh, next, the next step is the processing of the text data um, to understand the request and process the request. Um, the next step would be data, the data response to audio conversion takes place. Um, so Alexa responding to your request saying, you know, I've taken care of this or I've scheduled this meeting, I've set your alarm. Um, and then the machine responds to the human by playing the audio file. So that's uh, uh, what that process uh, looks like. Um, and natural language processing is uh, behind all of that being able to take place. Yep. There we go. Um, yeah, so uh, when we're thinking about natural language processing, some example use cases would be things like Google Translate, um, word processors such as Grammarly or Microsoft Word when you're doing your spelling and grammar checks. Uh, interactive voice response applications. So um, if you've ever called uh, your bank and you go through the um, call center uh, responses to you know, reach certain departments or get certain information, um, that's uh, an example. Um, and then personal assistant applications such as Google Assistant, Siri, and Alexa. Uh, there we go. Um, so why is natural language processing difficult? So it's considered a difficult problem in computer science uh, because of the nature of uh, human language. Um, so the rules that dictate the passing of information using natural languages are not easy for computers to understand. I'm sure if you've ever traveled outside of uh, your city or your state to even another part of uh, our country, um, you've uh, discovered a lot of dialects, syntax, um, colloquialisms, right? So uh, if, if there's not a necessarily universal standard of language, it it's really depends on uh, context. Um, so uh, in, in even, even in the English language, um, as with other foreign languages as well, 
there's a lot of rules that dictate how the languages function. Um, and as you probably have noticed as, as uh, from a kid growing up, uh, a lot of times we don't necessarily follow these rules. So how do you teach a computer um, to understand uh, natural language that um, we as humans uh, create, bend, and change uh, as time changes as well? Um, so some of the rules can be high level and abstract. For example, when someone uses a sarcastic remark, remark to pass information. So how are we teaching that to a computer? Um, so on the other hand, some rules can be low level. For example, using the character S to signify the plurality of items, right? So um, there's some low level rules um, which are easier to uh, convey and then there's high level rules which are more abstract and much harder to teach uh, to computers. Um, so comprehensively understanding the human language requires under understanding both the words and how the concepts are connected to uh, deliver the intended message. So context is really everything. So while humans can easily master language, the ambiguity and imprecise characteristics of natural languages that's what makes NLP really difficult for uh, machines to implement. Um, so how does natural language processing work? So natural, langu it, natural language processing entails um, applying algorithms to identify and extract uh, the natural language rules that each, um, sorry, that uh, unstructured language data is converted into a form that computers can understand, right? So it's taking unstructured language, uh, for instance, when uh, your, uh, uh, your Alexa is capturing audio to um, uh, be able to process your request. So it's, it needs to be able to, it's applying algorithms to take that unstructured data, that unstructured language data and convert it into a form that the computer can understand. So when the text has been provided, the computer utilizes the algorithms to extract meaning associated with every sentence and then collect the essential data from them. So sometimes the computer may fail to understand the meaning of a sentence uh, leading to obscure results. Um, so I'm sure, especially five years ago, uh, you everyone's played around when with uh, Google Translate, you've probably got some really odd or strange translation results back. Um, so uh, an example of that is um, uh, just an old English to Russian translation. So there's a quote, uh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And translating, um, it was translated to Russian and then back to English. And the result was the vodka is good, but the meat is rotten. Right, so that's just an example of how um, context is really important and uh, the um, intention uh, and the meaning behind uh, the context can really get lost in translation. Um, so what are techniques used in uh, Hey, Jenna. Yeah. It looks like in the comments section, um, oh. they're saying that the speaker's video bottom half is being cut off. Like they can only see the top of your head right now. Do you oh. know? Yeah. Interesting. But I think it's a screen. So. Okay. Yeah. For all the videos, the four speaker videos, 30% top of them. Uh, uh. Let's see. Are you able to see the video okay? Yeah, me? Yeah, the shared screen. Yeah, uh, if you're having some issues with the video or audio, I would uh, recommend refreshing your screen. Okay, okay perfect. Cool. Thank you. Um, okay, so... Uh, what are techniques used in natural language processing? So what's going on under the hood here? Um, so uh, there's two, sorry, uh, there's two main techniques uh, to natural language processing. 
One is syntactic analysis and the other is semantic uh, analysis. Um, so syntax analysis. Um, so syntax is referring to the arrangement of words in a sentence so that they make sense grammatically. Um, natural language processing syntactic analysis is used to assess how the natural language aligns with those grammar rules. So computer algorithms are used to apply grammatical rules to a group of words and derive meaning from them. Um, so some techniques that can be used are uh, one, the first one's called lemmatization. So it, it, it uh, is reducing the various inflected forms of a word into a single form for easy analysis. Um, we have morphological segmentation, which involves dividing words into individual units called morphemes. We have word segmentation, which involves dividing a large piece of con uh, continuous text into distinct units. We have part of speech tagging, which involves identifying the part of speech for every word. Uh, parsing involves undertaking grammatical analysis for the provided sentence. Uh, sentence breaking involves placing sentence boundaries on a larger piece of text. And uh, another uh, is stemming, which involves cutting the inflected words to the root form. Um, here we go. And then, so we, that's syntax. So the second part is semantics. So semantics is referring to the meaning that's conveyed by a text. So semantic analysis is one of the difficult aspects of natural language processing um, that uh, requires uh, a lot more to be fully worked out. So uh, it involves applying computer algorithms to understand the meaning and interpretation of words and how sentences are structured. So some techniques for semantic analysis are um, word sense disambiguation, which involves giving meaning to a word base. Uh, I'm sorry, giving meaning to a word based on context, uh, which is very, very important. Um, and then another example is natural language generation, which involves using debates to derive semantic intentions and convert them into human language which is what we're gonna, uh, you, you'll see with the IBM Project Debater. Cool. Um, so some examples of natural language processing. So communication dice devices for people with disabilities. So uh, you may have seen, um, there's some devices that convert sign language to text. That would be, a, that's a great example. Um, machine translation of tech manuals and catalogs into foreign languages. Uh, using something like Google Translate, which is um, much more sophisticated than it was in its uh, infancy. Um, and then another cool example is aircraft maintenance. So natural language processing actually helps mechanics, uh, uh, aircraft mechanics synthesize information from giant aircraft manuals. And it's able to help find meaning in verbal and handwritten reports uh, of problems from pilots um, and help them uh, solve those problems um, without having to uh, search through thousands and thousands of pages of, of, um, of manuals. Um, so uh, NLP and NLU. So how are these things different? So natural language uh, uh, understanding is just a subtopic of natural language processing. So it involves breaking down the human language into machine readable format. Um, so this includes applications for uh, text categorization, machine translation, and question answering. Um, so natural language understanding uses grammar rules and common syntax to understand the overall context and meaning of natural language uh, beyond the literal definitions. So its goal is to understand written or spoken language in a way a human would. Um, so NLU is used in natural language processing tasks like topic classification, language detection, and sentiment analysis. Um, so sentiment analysis uh, is um, uh, interpreting emotions within a text and categorizing them as positive, negative, or neutral. We're gonna 
look at that right before we uh, take a deeper dive into Project Debater. Uh, language detection automatically understands the language of a written text. Um, and topic classification is able to understand natural language to automatically sort text into predefined uh, groups of topics. So NLU is a subtopic of NLP, um, but how are they different? So NL, natural language understanding, as I mentioned, is a subfield of natural language processing. Uh, both NLP and NLU aim to make sense of unstructured data, but they're not the same thing. So uh, natural language processing is concerned with how computers are programmed to process language and facilitate the natural back and forth communication between computers and humans. Uh, while natural language understanding focuses on the machine's ability to understand the human language. So it refers to how the unstructured data is rearranged so that machines may understand and analyze it. So some examples of natural language understanding, automated reasoning, uh, automated routing of tickets, and something like question answering. So NLU sentiment is something we're gonna focus on a little bit more um, today, uh, uh, especially with uh, look, taking a look into um, our IBM project debater. So sentiment helps us uh, quantify perception. So when a new product is released, organizations wanna know how people are talking about it. Do they like it? Do they hate it? Are they neutral about it? So um, uh, natural language understanding sentiment uh, allows, um, and, uh, allows the ability to analyze uh, how things are discussed. Um, so with this feature, you can analyze the sentiment toward specific target phrases and the sentiment of the document as a whole. Um, so you can also get uh, sentiment information for detected entities and keywords um, by uh, using uh, the sentiment option for those features as well. Um, so sentiment analysis is what we're gonna focus on. Uh, so sentiment analysis automatically interprets emotion within a text and as I mentioned, categorizes them as positive, negative, or neutral. So by quickly understanding and processing uh, and analyzing thousands of online conversations, sentiment analysis tools can deliver valuable insights about how customers view a brand or product. Um, sentiment and specifically targeted sentiment um, helps us quickly understand this. So, Unlike emotion, sentiment breaks down into three categories, that positive, negative, or neutral. Uh, and natural language understanding offers multiple ways to extract sentiment. Um, so document sentiment is the result from retrieving the basic sentiment feature and calculates a positive, negative, or neutral label uh, as applied to an entire document. Um, so that's helpful when you're looking at a paragraph or text uh, or less at a time. Uh, targeted sentiment results from adding sentiment targets to your, um, uh, to your API call. So targeted sentiment is great for collecting the sentiment about a particular phrase across an article. Uh, keywords and entities uh, sentiment gets results for the sentiment on the keywords and entities calls. Um, uh, so focusing on specific keywords and entities within the text. Um, so one thing I wanted to share, uh, if you want to learn a little bit more and dive a little deeper into natural language understanding sentiment, uh, here's a really great Medium article that I found. Um, so if you feel free to take a look at that, uh, everything, you'll have access to everything in the slides as well. Um, so now I want to move on and get into, uh, IBM Project Debater. Um, so what is it? So IBM Project Debater has been uh, in development since 2012, um, and it's considered IBM's next big milestone for AI. Uh, 
some previous breakthroughs were Deep Blue in 1997, and uh, you may have remembered the Watson on Jeopardy in 2011. Um, so we've made a lot of uh, uh, a lot of headway since then. Um, so this is what IBM. I'm sorry. This is what Project Debater looks like. It's like this long, tall, black machine and it, and it has a little blue oval in the middle that uh, moves with the inflectua uh, inflectuation of um, uh, of the responses from Project Debater. Uh, so Project Debater is AI technology de developed by IBM Research uh, and the focus is to expand human minds through impartial debate. So IBM researchers were exploring the boundaries of AI by teaching computers to create uh, better informed points of view. Um, the goal is to build a system that helps people make evidence-based decisions when the answers are not black and white. Um, so you'll probably see a lot of this now with there's so much information coming from all different sources and all different places all the time constantly um, and it can be hard to determine uh, uh, what, what are the uh, evidence what are the uh, reference-backed pieces of evidence and what is opinion and um, piecing apart uh, uh, information to put together a really well-informed uh, opinion. So Project Debater is the first AI system that can debate humans on complex topics. Uh, so Project Debater digests massive text and then it constructs a well-structured response uh, on that given topic it can deliver it uh, with clarity and purpose um, and uh, effectively rebut its opponent. Its opponent. Um, so eventually, Project Debater will be able to help people reason by providing compelling evidence-based arguments um, and essentially limiting the influence of emotion, bias, or ambiguity. Oops. So, it was so what does project, or I'm sorry, how typo does Project Debater work? Um, so Project Debater relies on three uh, capabilities. So the first is data-driven speech writing and delivery, which is uh, the ability to automatically generate a whole speech uh, reminiscent of uh, an opinion article. Um, and deliver it persuasively. Uh, so the second is listening comprehension. So that is the ability to understand a long spontaneous speech made by uh, a human uh, in order to construct a meaningful rebuttal to, uh, to that. The third is the system's ability to model human dilemmas and form uh, arguments made by humans in different debates um, based on a unique knowledge graph. Uh, so by combining these three core capabilities, it's able to con uh, conduct a meaningful debate with a human debater. So why is project debater important? Um, so the rise of uh, one-sided and doctored narratives is challenging society and our platforms. So a lot of times we talk past one another and we need to find a smarter way um, to communicate uh, effectively with each other. So new developments in language and reasoning in AI can help shine a light in the darkness of distorted facts uh, to provide diverse, well-informed viewpoints, uh, both, the, both for and against. Um, so uh, the world has, is, over overflowing with so much information, misinformation, and superficial thinking. So Project Debater is pushing the frontiers of AI to facilitate intelligent debate so we can build well-informed arguments and make better decisions. And here's a full picture. So if you wanna just take a look. So um, this was from, I think, 2019. Uh, so this is the human opponent to Project Debater. And that's what it looks like. So it's this really tall, um, black, thin, uh, well, I'll say flat, um, uh, stick-looking machine. And the small uh, oval in the middle uh, 
uh, fluctuates with as uh, Project Debater gives its response. It, it fluctuates with the, the intonation um, in its response. So why, why would anybody want to do this? Like, why teach a machine to debate? Um, I know why we talked about uh, why it's important, but you know, why teach a machine to do this? Um, so culturally, the origins of debate um, are not in conflict and competition, but in democracy and discussion. So debate is extremely important uh, culturally, across uh, globally and culturally, um, because debate enriches our decision making and it helps people weigh the pros and cons of new ideas and philosophies. So it's really important to uh, new innovation and creativity and, and um, uh, essentially coming up with you know, new life-saving uh, innovations. So it lies at the core of civilized society. We debate not only to convince others of our own opinion, but to understand and learn from each other's viewpoints. Uh, so in the future, uh, we believe machines will be able to help humans with many important decisions that we make daily. So, and if we look at how IBM uh, Project Debater works, so how is this different than a keyword search, right? How is it different than just looking up and giving a response? Um, so a keyword search will bring back a collection of relevant documents, uh, or it may trigger, trigger a simple response that has already been prepared, right? But um, Project Debater is developing a much deeper understanding of the, of the topic and constructing a point of view based on its findings. So it's not just regurgitating information that it's finding uh, online or from scientific research articles. It's not just regurgitating that information. It's actually understanding the topic and constructing a new response based on, the, based on those findings. Um, and that's very difficult for a machine to do. So to construct the speech, it has to first remove all of the redundant claims so it doesn't repeat the same point again and again and then it looks at what's left and extracts the most important points um, of those to make its argument. So how does Project Debater learn a topic then? So it doesn't actually learn a topic, but it's very good at quickly creating a persuasive narrative based on the data that it has available. Uh, so the debater system was taught to debate unfamiliar topics. So it can debate many different topics as long as they're well covered in the uh, uh, massive collection of written texts, um, uh, especially entire works of a particular author or a body of writing on a particular subject. So the more robust um, and the more well covered it is, the better. Um, and then the system mines that data uh, which includes hundreds of millions of articles from numerous well-known newspapers and magazines. Um, so I'm going to pass over to uh, Julia, so, and she's going to uh, give a little bit more of a look at Project Debater, and then we're going to take a look at a clip of Project Debater in action. Okay. So, so Janet, do you just want to keep with your slides? Um, if you'd like, I can do that. Yeah, let's just do that because I'm <laughs> scared of my hand off. <laughs> it's, okay. it's okay. No worries. All right. Uh, cool. Okay. So All right. let's go here. All right. Cool. Thanks. Okay. So how does Project Debater form an argument? So, um, you know, basically the position of the argument, does it? how does it know that you are for or against um, in your argument to the debater, right? So if you're if you're arguing with the debater, how do they know, how does the debater know, right? If you, if your position on the event. So it does this by understanding, we, we train it to understand the linguistic nuances of um, what, what you're saying. So uh, basically, so let's say the topic is food preference, right? So since I think it was Oscar, you mentioned tuna melt in the discussion. So I, I pivoted this <laughs> because it's a lot more interesting to talk about food. Yes. Um, yeah. So, okay. So if we say to debater, all right, so strawberry pizza does not provide adequate deliciousness. So 
Has anybody ever tried strawberry pizza? Jenna, have you ever had strawberry pizza? No, it took me a long time to eat pineapple on pizza. I don't know about strawberry. Yeah, see pineapple, everybody knows those arguments now. So it was like <laughs> strawberry. And actually I Googled this before um, before coming on and there's like a strawberry bacon recipe. It looks kind of gross to me, but who knows? It might, if y'all if y'all have ever tried it or want to try it, please, please put that in the chat. I'd love to hear about that. <laughs> um, so, okay. So we know that the machine does not know about strawberry pizza, right? Um, and But we know that if I say that, and I'll repeat it, strawberry pizza does not provide adequate deliciousness, that I'm not exactly for strawberry pizza, right? So and that's where the linguistic nuances come in. We, we train it to understand and break down at sentence level, like, okay, so does not is negative, right? So that's a negative sentiment. How does that relate to adequate and how does that relate to um, deliciousness, right? Because that's, that tends to be a positive word, right? So overall, you know, debater is trained at sentence level on the entirety of those relationships within the sentence, as well as the sentiment to make that polarity overall of that sentence. Um, so it breaks it down. Okay, so understands nuances, we went over that. Um, I think that, I think we can move on now to the next slide. <laughs> I think that, that, that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> yeah, even said, I love pineapple pizza. I am, I, I'm, I'm partial to pineapple pizza too. <laughs> okay, so, all right, yeah, the format. I think we're at the format of the debate. No. Yeah, all right, cool. So, We've talked about how it debates. So, you know, what, how is it presented in the debate? So how, how does the debate actually occur? So it's a traditional debate. So we tried to have it to be as traditional as possible. So there's a four minutes, I think they say the, the um, what is it called? Four minute opening. So I, I, you can tell, I don't know about y'all, but I've never done debates. I'm not smart enough for that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like off the cuff, like respond to people. That's kind of like, I'd probably get massive social anxiety <laughs> if I did that. So four minute opening, then a four minute rebuttal. And let me know if this is traditional because I was thinking, oh, this sounds traditional to me, but four minute rebuttal. And then there's a two minute closing. So for these debates with the debater. And, um, you know, yeah, so, I guess that's pretty much it for the format. That, that pretty much sums it up. So I think we can go to the next slide. All right. Yeah, and this is a great topic because I've actually used a service that they use in this, this uh, machine uh, easily over 200 times because my manager said that I made over 200 chatbots one year. So, <laughs> so okay, so is it actually listening? We, we went to deductions before this, right? So we spoke about, okay, how does it break it down? How does it understand? Now we're talking about, does it listen? And that's usually something we apply to humans, right? That's kind of a skill for humans um, that we don't think about the machine listening to us, ex you know, except for security, we do all think about that. Um, but yeah, it does listen and it uses uh, Watson speech to text. And there's actually a demo online that you can look at for Watson speech to text. I actually use it sometimes myself. It's just, you know, during my normal work, that's that's something I do. It's actually a lot of fun, the demo is. Um, so yeah, so it listens, IBM Debater listens using that Watson speech to text service. Um, and it actually identifies the key concepts that you're saying, just like we talked about with the semantics and all that. So it, it, it has that speech to text so that in the textual form, it can analyze the concepts, um, you know, the topics, and then, you know, overall measure, okay, what's the polarity of the stance of the person um, who's debating? So are they for or against that topic? So, and, and prepares to destroy the human in the rebuttal. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> okay, and this is a great topic because this is something that you would think like, you know, robots kind of have the up on us for this, right? Because like, we get emotional, right? We get emotional when we talk about things. And that's another reason why I probably never did debating. It's because I probably start <laughs> like breaking down. 
<laughs> during the debate. I'd probably want debater to debate for me, really, because, you know, it can argue both sides. It is impartial because it is a machine, so it's not going to cry <laughs> in the debate. And um, that's what makes it so interesting because that's the enhancement it brings to humans too. Like, um, like how I just said, I would want the debater to debate for me because you know, if I was emotional or something, I wouldn't want to debate. So it can be impartial and it can enlighten us or even add that um, the insights of understanding the other side, you know, if we are emotional, it, it can give us greater. And that, that's something that's, that kind of feeds into the business case for this as well. So yeah. Okay, awesome. So let's see it. Let's see it in action now. And this is a one minute and I think 32 second video. So not that long. Just wanna make sure we have audio. So let me, let me know if you can't hear it. To the debate will be out if your position changed. We're also going to put a second question in there. We just want to know, in general, uh, who you feel better enriched your knowledge of this topic. Then we will share the results of the voting uh, after we have a panel discussion with uh, Harish and two of the IBM scientists who are behind this fascinating research. They're going to explain in even more detail what we just saw happen and how it happened. So to reveal now, the resolution of the evening is this. We should subsidize preschool we should subsidize preschool. That's gonna be the resolution. And I just wanna say, in terms of, of what we uh, mean by that, the way that we're framing it, we are not talking about preschool in any particular locale, no particular city or state. We are also uh, not referring to any particular program that exists or any particular proposal out there. And finally, we are not talking about uh, targeting uh, or cho choosing preschool programs for any particular in any yeah, place. I think this is the wrong video. So let me actually share my screen. Oh. I have the video. Okay. Sorry, Sorry, hold on. Let me. Ask you please to take out your smartphones yeah. and type in the URL. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So I'm just going to share my whole screen. I'm sorry ahead of time. No, that's okay. Okay. All right. Here we, we go. Need... Is it working? I might need to. Let me stop sharing so you can. Do you, do you also see my screen? Yeah. Okay, awesome. I'm spending. Uh oh. That we'll be able to debate humans. And now we are going to have the first full live debate between the systems. If you turn off your camera, it'll make it bigger. If you look at the history of AI, games really helped us make a lot of advances. Unlike games, real world problems, a lot of times they don't have a clear bottom line with. We have to step away from games. We have to step away from black and white challenges. So AI is now going to deal with the subjectivity of human reality. You can draw the rules of chess. You cannot draw the rules of conversation. That's impossible. How nuts is that it could take artificial intelligence to teach us to understand other human perspectives better? The magic of, of debater is that it can argue on any topic thrown at it under the sun. It's a single debate. It's just one debate. In a single debate, many things can happen. Who do you think is going to win tonight? Well, what we really want is to create systems that work with us so that we can make better decisions. Ladies and gentlemen, here we go, Project Debater. Greetings, Harish. I suspect you've never debated a machine. Welcome to the future. 